God, we, we ask that you would open our hearts and minds to receive your word, because we know that as I read these scriptures, and some of them even uh, lengthy, that it can just be words that go in one ear and out the other, unless your spirit teaches us how to hear them differently. Come, Holy Spirit. Open the eyes and the ears and the hearts of your people to be attentive and responsive to your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. First scripture reading today comes from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 55, verses 6 to 13. Listen to God's word. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord. He will have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bear sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the manner for which I sent it. For you will go out with joy and, and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush, the cypress will come up. Instead of the nettle, the myrtle will come up. And it will be a memorial to the Lord for an everlasting sign which will not be cut off. And the gospel lesson today comes from the gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 to 18. Listen to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you that they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your room and close the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. And when you're praying, don't use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they'll be heard for their many words. So don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive others of their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they're fasting. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please, if you have your Bibles, open them to the book of Job. Job chapters 34 and 35 are where we'll be today. These chapters represent the middle section of the speech of Elihu, a man who we just got introduced to last week. He seems to come really out of nowhere in the book of Job as we've been reading through it. Um, he, he fits into the structure of the book and he fits theologically between God and these four men, Job and his three friends. 
who have been arguing, Job and his three friends, they've been arguing with each other since chapter 3. Lots of back and forth. And what, what these three men, or these four men, have never been able to figure out in all their arguing, Elihu gets it right. Elihu gets it right. He speaks like a prophet to these men, revealing the understanding of God that they could never get on their own. Listen and follow along as I read these two chapters. I know it's a bit lengthy, um, and I would recommend, even though it is a bit lengthy, that you go back and read it again. This is one of those, th one of those speeches where you've got to sort of read it a couple of times to let it sink in, especially since it's written in poetry, and, and since it's um, um, Hebrew translated into English, it can sometimes wash over you. Do the best you can, though, to, to hear this conversation and to hear God speaking in and through it. I encourage you. Job 34 and 35. Then Elihu continued and he said, Hear my words, you wise men, and listen to me, you who know. For the ear tests words as the palate tastes food. Let us choose for ourselves what's right. Let us know among ourselves what is good. For Job has said, I am righteous, but God has taken away my right. Should I lie concerning my right? My wound is incurable, though I am without transgression. What man is like Job? who drinks up derision like water, who goes in the company with the workers of iniquity and walks with wicked men. For he said, it profits a man nothing when he is pleased with God. Therefore listen to me, you men of understanding, far be it from God to do wickedness and from the Almighty to do wrong. For he pays a man according to his work and makes him find it according to his way. Surely God will not act wickedly and the Almighty will not pervert justice. Who gave him authority over the earth? And who has laid on him the whole world? If he should determine to do so, he should gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together, and man would return to dust. But if you have understanding, hear this. Listen to the sound of my words. Shall one who hates justice rule? And will you condemn the righteous mighty one who says to a king, worthless one, to nobles, wicked ones, who shows no partiality to princes, nor regards the rich above the poor, for they are the work of his hands. In a moment they die, and at midnight people are shaken and pass away, and the mighty are taken away without a hand. For his eyes are upon the ways of a man, and he sees all his steps. There's no darkness or deep shadow where, where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves, for he doesn't need to consider a man further that he should go before God in judgment. He breaks in pieces the mighty men without inquiry and sets others in their place. Therefore, he knows their works, and he overthrows them in the night, and they're crushed. He strikes them like the wicked in a public place, because they turned aside from following him and had no regard for any of his ways, so that they caused the cry of the poor to come to him, and that he might hear the cry of the afflicted. When he keeps quiet, who then can condemn? When he hides his face, who then can behold him? That is, in regard to both nation and man. So that the godless men would not rule, nor be snares of the people. For has anyone said to God, I have borne chastisement, I will not offend any more. Teach me what I do not see. If I have done iniquity, I will not do it again. Shall he recompense you on your terms? Because you've rejected it. For you must choose and not I. Therefore declare what you know, men of understanding will say to me, and wise men who hears me. Job speaks without knowledge, and his words are without wisdom. Job ought to be tried to the limit, because he answers like wicked men, and he adds rebellion to his sin. He claps his hand among us and multiplies his words against God. Then Elihu continued and said, Do you think this is according to justice? Do you say my righteousness is more than God's? For you say, what advantage will it be to you? What profit will I have more than if I had sinned? I'll answer you and your friends with you. Look at the heavens and see and behold the clouds. They're higher than you. If you have sinned, what do you accomplish against him? And if your transgressions are many, what do you do to him? If you're righteous, what do you give to him? Or what does he receive from your hand? Your wickedness is for a man like yourself, and your righteousness is for a son of man. Because of the multitude of oppressions, they cry out. They cry out for help because of the arm of the mighty. But no one says, 
Where is God my maker who gives songs in the night, who teaches us more than the beasts of the earth and makes us wiser than the birds in the heavens? There they cry out, but he does not answer because of the pride of evil men. Surely God will not listen to an empty cry, nor will the Almighty regard it. How much less when you say you do not behold him. The case is before him and you must wait for him. And now, because he has not visited in his anger, nor has he acknowledged transgression well, so Job opens his mouth emptily. He multiplies words without knowledge. Once again, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'm so impressed with the wisdom of Elihu. As I've studied this, I've been so impressed with the wisdom of Elihu, or rather the wisdom of God coming through Elihu. You know, my whole life growing up in the church, before I studied, even, even being a minister of the church, before I studied for this, this sermon series, every time the book of Job was brought up, people just kind of threw their hands up in the air and said, well, that's a book about unknowable suffering. And, or, or worse, they would reaffirm essentially the prosperity gospel of the other three friends. If you are righteous, then God will reward you. And see, the proof is that Job is righteous and God rewards him sevenfold there at the end of the, bo- the book. But as I've studied this, neither of those things are true. In fact, I, I think Elihu, the more I look at it, the more I'm amazed about it. I think Elihu may be the key to understanding this book of Job. He lets us know precisely what Job's sin is. Therefore, he's not a righteous sufferer. We'll see that. He also lets us know why Job is suffering. And it's not because of his sin or anything else that he did. I mean, I mean this speech is astonishing. It's astonishing. The first thing that Elihu does is to rightly convict Job of his sin. In chapter 34, verses 1 to 9, what Job does in those verses is, or what Uh, What Job does wrong is he makes a public display of his suffering, uh, and, and when he does that, he begins to speak about God in issues that he doesn't understand. And in doing that, he misrepresents God. And he misrepresents God, this is the key, to other people, to other sinners who need salvation just as he does, and here he is misrepresenting God. See, this is the line that Elihu picks up from Job's speeches to say that he misrepresented him. For he said, it profits a man nothing when he is pleased with God. And Elihu's saying, that's not true, Job. You don't know what you're talking about. Now we should remember that Job's friends have all accused him of sin. All of them have. But only Elihu is correct. All of the other friends looked at Job's suffering and they said, Job, this must be because of some secret sin that you've committed that we don't know of, but you must know it. You need to admit it. You're suffering because you did something. But Elihu is saying, Job, you're not suffering because of your sin, but in your suffering you have sinned. Elihu is not accusing Job of some secret sin he doesn't know about. Rather, he's accusing Job of what he has heard from Job's own lips to Elihu's own ears. Job has publicly questioned whether or not God is actually good and therefore finds himself counted among the very sinners whom he misleads. What man is like Job, who goes in with the workers of iniquity and walks with wicked men? Elihu clarifies his point further in chapter 35, verse 16. Job opens his mouth emptily. He multiplies words without knowledge. Now, you may be thinking, I don't know, John, you might be stretching this a bit, but I know this is true because at the end of the book of Job, when Job finally repents, the very thing he repents of is this exactly. At the end of the book of Job, he says, I have declared that which I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Therefore, I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. So let's ask this question. What's so wrong with teaching something about God that may be a little bit off? What's so wrong with that? And here it is. The eternal condition of the human soul depends upon, depends upon the gospel being communicated as God put it forth clearly. Listen to what Jesus says about the miscommunication of the gospel. Luke 17, verses 1 to 2. It is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. But woe to, him who through, woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him 
If a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea, then that he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. Jesus treats this subject with more severity than he does anything else. In so many places, he is crystal clear that there is one way to salvation, and it is through him. And, and that he himself is living proof. Jesus himself is living proof that God is not mean, that he loves, that he's a loving God. Jesus himself is proof that God does not want you to be damned, but to be saved. And those who teach another gospel teach dangerous lies that lead people eternally, eternally astray. It's a serious sin. This is Job's sin. In his suffering, he misrepresents the character of God to those who need to know the character of God. They trusted Job to speak wisely, and he failed. Then in verses 10 to 30, Elihu makes the case that God is not, in fact, wicked. Job said, it doesn't benefit me anything. You know, I don't even know if I can trust in God's goodness. And Elihu says, God is not wicked. And in fact, God always does what's right. That's what he points out in those verses. But he uses examples of rulers. That's a, it's really kind of interesting. As you look through those verses, he uses kings and mighty men and rulers and princes. And what he does is Elihu seems to make the case that God will not allow, God will not allow wicked rulers to continue to rule. It says in those verses, he breaks them in, he breaks in pieces mighty men. He overthrows them in the night and they're crushed but it's interesting it's interesting isn't it because we know that there are wicked rulers in the world we see them we can look out in, at various countries and see that wicked men often will rule those and yes most of the time we know that they are eventually either voted out or usurped or um, or arrested or prevailed upon by more noble forces but it doesn't always happen does it it doesn't always happen, at least not in ways that we notice in our lifetime. And this begins to get, I think, at another point that Elihu is making. Job is missing the goodness of God because he's missing the timing of God. Job's missing the goodness of God because he's missing the timing of God. If you jump over to chapter 35 and look at verse 14, Job's frustrated because in his suffering he feels like God isn't there, isn't listening. He's distant. But Elihu's trying to help Job. He's trying to help Job understand that he can't impose his own timetables on God. How much less when you say you do not behold him. The case is before him, and now you must wait for him. There's a meme I saw once um, online. It made me chuckle. <laughs> the meme said this, a Presbyterian is never early nor is he ever late. He always arrives precisely when he was predestined to. <laughs> Which is funny because in one sense it's true. In one sense it's true, nothing happens. Nothing, nothing happens outside of the predetermined will of God. Jesus says not even a sparrow falls to the ground apart from the will of God. But on the other hand, it's annoying when you set a time to meet somebody and they arrive 30 minutes after that set time. Here on planet Earth, we call that being late, don't we? But, but that only happens because we live our lives imposing our plans and our timing on top of already existing plans and already existing timing. That is God's plans and God's timing. And sometimes you can see this really clearly. You've probably all had something like this happen to you, maybe not quite as, as dramatic, but imagine that you're at home and you're already running late for a very important meeting and, and you've, you've lost your keys and your phone and you can't find it. This is like my life every other day, I think. I lose my stuff all the time. But you're searching for it and you're already late and you're getting so frustrated and so anxious and, 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 and then you finally find your keys and you get on your way and you realize that just a few minutes before at an intersection near your home, there was an 18-wheeler that, that lost control and plowed through the light, killing four people. And you think... If I'd been on time, that would have been me. See, you weren't late. You're right in God's timing. God got, knows how to keep you in his plan. I've heard on more than one occasion that the year 2020 has been referred to by lots of different people as a dumpster fire. <laughs> you guys heard this? 2020 has just been a crazy year. A venomous election cycle. 
divided political ends of the spectrum. Protests, riots, of course, coronavirus, quarantines, lockdowns. All of it makes the murder hornets at the beginning of the year seem like a distant memory. Do you remember the murder hornets? A dumpster fire. A word that aptly describes a chaotic disaster. But I want to put forward to you this. 2020 is not a dumpster fire. It is a carefully orchestrated unfolding of God's plan. A plan that is good for his people. Though it is certainly not our plan, and we may be far from understanding how all these pieces ultimately fit together, it is God's plan. And one day, whether it be on this side of life or next, we will see clearly how God has orchestrated each of these events to bring about his glory and our joy. I want to encourage you with this. God knows what he's doing in your life. He knows what he's doing in your life. He has a good plan for your life and your death and your resurrection. And there is only one way for it to happen, and that is the way that it is happening. He knows how to unfold the events of your life in the best way possible, and that is the way that they're unfolding right now. I know sometimes we wish things would happen differently. We wish they'd happen more quickly or more slowly. But if they did, then they wouldn't be God's plan. Paul writes in the book of Romans, we know God causes all things to work together for good, for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. It's true of Job and it's true of each of us, we should trust God's timing. We should trust God's timing. Uh, in his timing, he will bring you through the specific trials that you're going through. And he's bringing you through because he knows that it's the only way that on the other end of those trials, you will be glorified in him. It has to happen this way. God unfolds it this way on purpose for his great glory and your great joy. The last verse in, in chapter 34 gives the gospel invitation, and so what I want to do for that is just put it at, there at the end. I'll pick it back up at the end of the sermon, but um, in chapter 35, we'll go briefly through 35, it's a short chapter, Elihu makes an important point, not just for Job, but really an important point for all of us. There he rightly contends that we are quick, we are quick to go to God when we are desperate and suffering, but we don't spend nearly enough time when things are good. He says in verses 10 and 11, but, but no one says, where's God my maker, who gives songs in the night, who teaches us more than the beasts of the earth and makes us wiser than the birds of the heavens. How often do we, how often do we marvel at the astounding beauty of our lives, at the, the complexity of our very existence, and then give thanks for it? How often do we take the quiet and comfortable moments in our lives to search the scriptures asking, where are you, God, my maker? Longing through the blessings of our lives and through the pursuits of our minds to understand the character of God. How often do we do that? Not often enough. Not often enough. If we did, we would not be nearly so shaken when the times of trial come. We would have developed a relationship of trust that lets us rest and even rejoice, even rejoice when it seems like the world around us is falling apart. Without that relationship, the tumultuous times can seem like God has gone silent or vanished. Verse 12, then they cry out, but he does not answer. And often the thought is, you hear this all the time, it's a very common, that's why it's brought up here. Often the thought is, well, God will answer my prayer if I'm a good person. But Elihu refutes that. He says in verses 6 to 8, if you have sinned, what do you accomplish against him? And if your transgressions are many, what do you do to him? If you're righteous, what do you give to him? What does he receive from your hand? Your wickedness is for a man like yourself, and your righteousness is for a son of man. Now, Elihu's not saying that what you do is not important to God. Clearly, the whole of Scripture makes it clear that it is important to God. 
but he is pointing out that our actions cannot leverage God. Our actions can't make God do or not do anything by our good or bad behavior. And, and God doesn't respond to our prayers on the basis of what we have done. God's not Santa Claus, you know, checking the nice list and the naughty list to see which one you're on and decide whether or not he's going to give you presents or a lump of coal. That's not, that's not how God works. In good times, we should go to God in prayer. And we should go to him not because we want anything from him, but because we love him. And then in bad times, we should go to God in prayer. But again, not because we want anything, but because we love him. We're told in the beginning of the book that Job is blameless and he's upright, fearing God and turning away from evil. And what's becoming clear here in the final aspects of Elihu's speech is that in some ways Job's righteous life has become his problem because instead of resting in his relationship with God, he was resting in his own blameless life. Instead of a heart that was humble before God, his heart stood sinfully proud as though he had actually earned something and deserved something before God. And we know this because when his time of trial came, he re it was revealed that he knew very little about the character of God. He thought God was, Job thought God was up there keeping score. But instead, God sends these trials into Job's life because he wanted something better from Job than a righteous life. What he wanted from Job was a relationship with him. And I can say with certainty today that God wants a relationship with you too. You know, if we, if we all had things our own way, I think we would prefer to be justified by our own behavior. That's what people want. They want to be justified by their own behavior. We'd set out a system where, where good people get good things and people who do bad things get bad things. And in our system, when there's someone who is good, who does something bad, well then God would punish them and correct their behavior and, and they get right back on the path. And that's fair, isn't it? It is fair. But the problem is it won't work. Look back at chapter 34, verses 31 and 32. For has anyone said to God, I have borne chastisement, I will not offend anymore. Teach me what I don't see. If I've done iniquity, I'll not do it again. Now we've all said something like that before, haven't we? We've all had a prayer where we say, God, I'm sorry for my sin, I promise, I promise I won't ever do it again. But how many of us are able to actually not ever sin again? None of us are. Us are able to do that. And so Elihu goes on to say, shall he recompense you on your terms? Because you've rejected it. For you must choose, not I. You've rejected your own terms by continuing to sin. Will you continue to insist on being justified on your own terms, terms that will never be able to save you? Or will you instead accept the gracious terms of Jesus Christ? Those terms of Christ are this. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up on the last day. If you're going to be saved on God's terms, then there's nothing that you can do because Jesus has already done it all for you. Your righteousness and your sin won't be judged because you'll be judged instead by Jesus' righteous life and his blameless character. Because of everything that Jesus accomplished, there's just this one thing left. Trust him. Trust him with a deep faith and love. Trust Jesus and live. Amen.